Uh, thanks so much for attending today. Um, so this is the 2024 Social Learning Innovator Awards, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you all today. Um, my name is Joe Ferraro, and I am uh, the CEO here at Hypothesis. I feel so lucky to be part of the Hypothesis team, but also here with you all today. Uh, the Social Learning Innovator Awards recognize educators and institutions who made significant impacts in the classroom by leveraging the power of social annotation. And Hypothesis, we believe that learning isn't just about consuming the content, but finding ways to engage with it, discuss it, and make connections with others throughout that process. And that's really where social annotation comes in. If you're new to social annotation and to Hypothesis, we started about 12 years ago with a pretty simple but powerful idea. What if we could bring the tradition of annotating text, something that's as old as reading itself, into the digital age? Hypothesis began really as a vision to make the internet more open and collaborative by enabling conversations within, in the margins of any type of digital document. Our journey started with a mission to help people engage deeply with the content and connect with one another. And that vision's really evolved over the last few years to focus heavily on education, where these interactions can have some pretty profound impact. Hypothesis really allows students and educators to collaboratively annotate readings, turning passive consumption of content into active, thoughtful engagement. And using Hypothesis, students aren't just reading, they're asking questions, they're sharing insights, and engaging in discussions that can really deepen their understanding and learning. Social annotation can bring students closer together to the text, as well as bring them closer to each other. And that's really what we're hoping to do. Since last year's ceremony, we've seen really incredible growth. We had almost 10 million annotations created by students in the last 10 months since our last ceremony. That's 10 million interactions. Each one of those is a moment of learning, collaboration, or insight that potentially may not have happened if students didn't have a way to talk right on top of the text. And I think that's a testament to the power of hypothesis in fostering deeper engagement. We're also seeing that impact even in this award ceremony. This year, we had three times the number of nominees as we did last year. That was our inaugural award ceremony. And that shows growing adoption of social annotation across campuses. What I think is really inspiring here is there are so many ways that social annotation can be used in a course. And so success using social annotation doesn't require using the tool for years. Some of the folks on the stage today have probably been using it for less than a full calendar year at this point. And they've been able to really show that in a short amount of time, you can drive that transformative engagement and help students achieve even greater success. If you're just getting started with social annotation, today's winners are a really great example of what's possible. So congratulations to all of our nominees and especially to the winners today. You're leading the way in building a more connected, engaging, and effective classroom. But with that said, let's welcome our winners to the event. Uh, so we have a variety of different um, categories that we have in the Social Learning Innovator Awards. Uh, we've got a dozen awards. Uh, not everybody was able to make it today, but these straddle different disciplines, humanities, business, STEM, social sciences, health sciences, writing. We focus on, you know, student impact, how AI is being impacted in the classroom. It's something that we talk with customers about every day. The specific pedagogy behind it, finding open education resources to give students access to low or no cost material, and then getting the support from administration and institutions themselves. So this is really a group effort across so many institutions. And if we could have given out more awards, we would have loved to. But I want to kick it off by welcoming our first uh, winners and our, pres our presenters uh, from the Institutional Award at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn that on over to uh, Amy Mangrick and Sarah Rivergate and uh, let you take it away from here. So thanks so much and congratulations on your Institutional Award. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully you can see that okay. Oops, let's see. There we go. Looks good? Yep. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. This is a great honor. We're so excited about this. We love Hypothesis at Uni University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. We've been a huge fan for a very long time. And so what I'd like to do just really briefly is give you a brief overview of how University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee came to love Hypothesis so much. And then Sarah, my colleague Sarah Refrigetti is gonna talk about the data that was collected and the effectiveness that we found with Hypothesis and open educational resources. 
So we, um, we've had a project, I think I'm gonna pull this off of there because I don't think you need to see that as well, uh, the videos. Uh, so we have been working on edu open educational resources and open textbooks at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I'll call it UWM, uh, at UWM since uh, 2016. Um, it is a collaborative project. It's a project between the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, which is our um, which is our pedagogical and technology unit on campus, supporting instructors, uh, and the UWM libraries. So uh, since 2016, we have saved students over 4.5 million dollars, and 40,000 students have been using open educational resources. So we first learned about Hypothesis uh, through uh, the plugin that was part of Pressbooks. So we had adopted Pressbooks, started exploring Pressbooks, and found Hypothesis, and just saw all kinds of potential that uh, hypo Hypothesis can have uh, in teaching and learning um, inside of Pressbooks. But more importantly, we wanted to see what that would look like and how that would function for our students and instructors inside of Canvas. So we, um, we wanted to do a pilot. We uh, worked with our institution to uh, get some funding to purchase a uh, hypothesis uh, proper. Uh, that was through some student generated funding that is collected through what we, we use, uh, what we call it the art educational technology fee. Uh, we did a pilot in 2020. Uh, we had 95% of our students find help hypothesis to be useful. And this was, this figure just blew me away because in the 20 years that I've been um, integrating technology into courses and course curriculum. This is the highest, um, most enthusiastic students have ever been uh, about um, any particular tool. Uh, we had 100% of instructors that planned to use it in their courses and recommended it to other teachers. And again, Hypothesis has been an amazing tool because um, again, I've never seen instructors share these resources with other instructors and the adoption of Hypothesis has really been an organic process. Um, they talk to each other about it and they love it and they, and they continue to use it. So during that pilot, we had quite a number of, of different kinds of courses across all kinds of disciplines. With that pilot, we uh, decided to adopt uh, Hypothesis and we have integrated it into our uh, course management system, which is Canvas. Uh, it is available for all of the instructors across the entire campus. Um, and it's integrated with assignments and with grading. And so at, with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah uh, to talk a little bit about the study that we conducted last year. Thank you so much, Amy. And also thank you to Kara and her team at Hypothesis who really helped us with this study. Um, we were interested given the background on open education resources and having Hypothesis as part of that program, what would happen um, if we compared open education with non-open open education resource courses. So we looked at 49 UWM courses using Hypothesis in the fall of 2023, um, and we pulled all that data together. There were 32 open education resource courses and 17 non-open education resource courses. Of that, there were 1,067 students involved in our study and over 27,000 um, hypothesis social annotations. So I'm thinking about Joe's comment about the millions of users, and we're just a small fraction of that, but still it seems pretty impressive for a study. Next slide, please. So overall in our study, we collected both quantitative and qualitative data. Students saw benefit in using hypothesis. So here's a quote from one of the students. Um, Seeing annotations from others sometimes challenged or confirmed my own thoughts about ideas or topics. So we're, we're getting engagement, but we're also connect, getting connection with others. The collective repository provided a rich text from which to draw new ideas and conclusions on our own and during class meetings. So again, that, that use of the word are makes this really important because the social annotation is this process that students are using to come together to understand um, and deepen their learning. There should be one more thing on there. Okay, so across all of the classes, um, the students averaged about 26 annotations. So 25.9 annotations per student. 
Um, when we look at separating the open education and the non-open education resource students, we saw some interesting things. So next slide, please. Here we saw on a per student average, the OER students were using about 31 annotations per student, whereas the non-OER students were making about 16 annotations. So if you consider on average, people were using 25.9 um, annotations. We see much more have heavily used on the OER side than the non-OER student side. And then when we look at the assignment average, so per assignment, how many annotations are being made, when they're using those open education resources, they're making an average, the classes are making an average per assignment of 86 annotations compared with the non-OER classes of only making 41 annotations. So paired with OER, it's really a powerful experience for these students. Next slide, please. So what are our takeaways? Um, this study demonstrates that hypothesis as a social annotation tool is effective for fostering greater student engagement and connecting students to each other or that sense of belonging. And that's across the board, whether it's OER or non-OER. But we know that paired with open education resources, it amplifies the benefits of social annotation. So again, thank you for this honor and award. Um, Amy and I are delighted to receive it and um, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And it's just, it's amazing to see the impact that it's having in the classroom day to day. But I mean, four and a half million dollars in savings and tuition just as you move to OER. I mean, I'm probably still paying interest on my books from my student loans a hundred years ago. So you're making a difference that it's not just while students are in class, but when they finish later on. So congratulations to you both and to the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Uh, so next, we're going to bring up our winner, uh, and this is the winner for OER, interestingly enough, and uh, that is Diana Fordham. She is at Missouri Southern State University. Hi, Diana. It's nice to see you again. It's great to be here. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on this award. You've, you've been doing a lot Thank of work you. with Hypothesis over the last few years, and uh, what got you started with social meditation? I believe it was one of our faculty he happened to call our office. I work in um, digital learning, plus I also teach, and called and said, have you ever heard of this product? I think it was my colleague he called, um, Tara, and um, we started looking into it, and I had just started um, with the OER committee here on campus to define OER and then to take it forward, and so I saw it, loved it, and now I would just be lost without it. And so... OER is a big investment at Missouri Southern um, from the conversations yes. we've had. Talk to me about how you got there and what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so in 2018, we um, started a OER, OER journey. Um, it was a student cost-saving initiative. And we, as a committee, got together and we defined OER in two terms. One, uh, open educational uh, resources that are absolutely free. And in 2018, that wasn't a lot. And so our second tier was with Vital Source, um, which is a textbook offering um, same day access text. And because it was so much cheaper than our textbooks, we decided to do that second tier OER. And Hypothesis was just starting with Vital Source, I believe, at that time. So we were one of the first pilots to be able to take that instant access textbook or second um, tier of OER and adopt that into our online courses. And so I can tell you in 2018, we had 298 rental books that we had a rental book system. Um, I just got the stats in for this semester, we have 20. That means that we have gone almost 100% to uh, instant access. And I would say there's a good portion of our faculty that are using um, Hypothesis to present the material. And so as you've moved to inclusive access and social learning, faculty are, that's a lot of change for faculty in a pretty short period of time. What advice would you give to educators that are just starting to move down this path? Persistence. 
And what we do, because we're in um, the digital learning, we get out and we invite ourselves. Well, I don't say we invite ourselves. We really strongly suggest they have us at their staff senate meetings um, and at their department meetings because I've had success with it, right? And so I can go in and I can present what that looks like. And as I bring more people on board with this um, annotation with hypothesis, I get a choir. And so the choir sings and we get more and more. And the way we're using it on campus, I mean, we've got a couple of uh, faculty that are using it as AI resistant assessment. And, you know, it takes a little bit more to set it up because we have to go in and set it up into groups, but he can actually have each student see their own hypothesis and he asked them to write on a particular subject or uh, a reading that they had and nobody can see each other's and you can't use AI to do it. So um, we're, we're starting to use this as one of our tools for AI resistant assessment as well. And this is something we're hearing a lot about. And so how does that help them resist AI specifically? Well, number one, they can't, it's timed. So, you know, he has a timer set um, within the Blackboard instance and he does not tell them what, they don't all get the same um, reading. And so they have to concentrate on formulating, writing a um, outline and then writing the paper. And you would run out of time if you did not use that time wisely to achieve the product that the um, uh, faculty member needs his students to do. So they, they're not out there on AI. Um, so that's one of the things he does. And, and, it's, and it is because it's annotating text and then writing about text. So um, I, it's a very clever way that he has come up with doing it. It's, one, it's our honors lead. He's um, done a really good job and he loves it. Yeah, and I think it's, it's fantastic that the faculty have taken to it. What about the students? How do they feel about it? Okay, that's, that's where I would like to concentrate on because I can tell you what I hear from my students. So, you know, we used to always um, have students buy my textbooks, $127 for a Western Civ textbook, and they would buy it because they'd be forced to, and they never opened it. So here's what I get. I'm finally reading the textbook or my money's not wasted. I had a parent stop me. I was somewhere else and they're in one of my classes. And she said, this is the first time that her daughter, she's a senior, um, has even opened a textbook in a course. And how grateful she was, the parent, I don't know about the student, but at this point, the parent was that all my money that I have spent for four and a half years, three and a half years at that campus, she's finally reading the textbook. And that's kind of a eye opener, right? And so I think as I, um, talk to people and parents who have students that are using it, but my own students will say things like, um, I teach in a flip style, so they have to do all the reading and all of the hypothesis assignments before I meet with them in my synchronous or in my face-to-face. -face. And what I will get as feedback is, um, I learned in the textbook this week, and that'll be a springboard for further discussion. I've never had that happen. In the 25 years I've taught, never has a student come into my class and said, this week in the textbook I learned, and could you answer this question, right? So I, I see that a lot. So I'm, I'm hearing back from the students. And then I always do a survey at the end of any of my classes to ask about these external integrations into Blackboard, hypothesis being one of them. Um, tell me your feedback, critical, good, or whatever. and I would say 90% come back and say um, it was a learning experience. I mean, I, they don't like reading. I mean, they're not saying, oh, I just love the textbook, but they do let me know with hypothesis, it is contributing to the learning in the classroom. And I get that feedback from, because I get it back every semester. So that's what my students are saying. That's That's wonderful. And I guess just as a wrap up question, I mean, if they're doing the reading now and it's they're getting something out of it, how do you think this might help them as they graduate and move into their professional careers? Well, I'm teaching my first ed tech as a graduate level course here. And of course, hypothesis is one that we're teaching. And I can see that they will, um, and they've said that they'll move forward as they start teaching to understand the value of why we have textbooks and the value really of annotation because the other aspect, I use vital source, but my ed tech is all OER. 
it's all um, PDF documents from the library, you know, from Rice University, their OER. And so just the different ways the hypothesis can be used as teachers, as I teach teachers, you know, they're intrigued because they actually just went through school too in grad school and didn't read their textbooks. So yeah, th this has been amazing. Awesome. It's it has been really amazing just to see. I met you, I think, for the first time probably about two years ago, and just years. the growth that we've seen at Missouri and just the different creative ways that folks are using it. Uh, just congratulations again on the award. It was really well deserved. And thanks for thank you us today. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Great. And so I, now I want to welcome up our next winner, Administrator of the Year, and that's uh, Dr. Ashley Love from the University of Incarnate Word. Uh, Ashley, I'm going to be in San Antonio next week at Educause, and I don't think I've even mentioned that to you. Oh, no. And of course, I am going to be at another conference. <laughs> Usually how it goes. But I, I, every time I go to San Antonio, I see the, the signs on the freeway as I'm going into the city for your exit. So I Oh, sure. exactly. Yeah. I mean, the campus is really beautiful. If um, some of you, if you have been to San Antonio, um, it's one of those um brick buildings. It reminds you of being on the East Coast. I grew up in New Jersey, so sometimes being on campus, it's a, a lovely campus. But thank you so much. What an honor to receive this award. And let me share my journey of how we started using hypothesis in our classes. So I am the Director of Graduate Studies uh, here at Dreaven School of Education at University of Incarnate Word. And we have approximately over 100 graduate students in our program. And in November of 2022, so right after, during the pandemic, we are a traditional university who had gone uh, completely online. And now we were faced with what do we do? Do we go back to being traditional or do we, you know, uh, adopt uh, the component of the online? So we've decided to do the best of both worlds. All our classes are actually now uh, offered in a high flex model. So we have the synchronous online portion like this, as well as face-to-face -face portion. So, um, so we have the a technology that was adopted into all our curriculum in our department. So in uh, November, uh, our instructional designers and our tech team asked if uh, they were looking at different softwares and Hypothesis was one of them. And uh, they were saying it's a social annotation tool. Are there any faculty members who are interested in pilot testing it before they purchased it? And of course, for me, I'm always looking to adopt new technology to make things easier for, especially for our graduate students. So I immediately volunteered to pilot test uh, the hypothesis in all my classes. Um, for example, our introduction to research and inquiry, all the way to our qualifying exam and our dissertation writing classes. Uh, the reason why I volunteered is because there's always that assumption that the adult learners should know or uh, they know how to do a lot of things. But if you're a first time graduate student, especially coming into a um, academic setting, you don't necessarily know how to approach and read these complex peer reviewed uh, journal articles. I, before using the hypothesis, you could tell in the classrooms that they're only reading the abstracts, <laughs> not the whole article. So it was such a game changer when we started pilot testing that next semester and just scaffolding and asking questions. And I know a lot of us do that in our courses, but actually using the hypothesis tool to guide the adult learners to how to read these articles and what kind of questions, and not only getting it from me, but also their peers, and they all had similar questions. So a lot of times when you're back in school, especially if you had years of experience in your industry and you're coming back to school, you don't want to look like, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about, but it gave me psychological safety for the adult learners to share and also build that community uh, within the classroom. And it happened pretty quickly uh, using hypothesis and also uh, what Diane and Amy and Sarah were mentioning is that the engagement was really, really high. Um, 
It also allowed me to build a community of practice with my graduate students, especially in the dissertation phases. Um, if you remember writing your dissertations or your master's thesis, it's a lonely road. So Hypothesis allowed um, at least my students to share their work and we were able to give feedback, critical feedback that it wasn't a personal attack, it was same, comments that were coming from the instructor as well as their peers. So it the uh, the critical feedbacks were well received by the recipient as opposed to a faculty member just giving the feedback because it's just in the grade book, but with the social annotation tool, they realize, ah, this might not be just the professor's perspective. Maybe this paragraph was really unclear. So that was really, really helpful. And also in terms of um, empowerment, I think in the beginning, we could see the progress of the um, where they were at at the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester uh, to see how much they have learned and the type of questions that they're asking were also changed as well. So as an instructor, as an administrator, and as a lifelong learner, I was uh, pleasantly surprised and also very inspired. And um, earlier this year, I'm gonna put a link here uh, for everyone is we were, I was able to get five of my graduate students to present with me about their experiences of using um, a new technology, especially hypothesis, and they loved it. They instantly, I use a lot of different um, uh, learning technology tools because sometimes it can be very, um, it's hard to engage a lot of the students on complex items. And one of the things that I noticed was easy to use. The students were able to just pick it up in a couple of seconds and uh, they were interacting with it. A lot of times when I introduce new tech tools, the students are like, oh no, Dr. Love, why? <laughs> so, and that was not the case. So um, I put the YouTube, uh, presentation that we did where my students were actually volunteering to uh, do the presentation with me with the instructional designer to show that I think it's important to work with the faculty, the students, the instructional designer, um, and the tech teams to ensure that ease of use and also adoption, as well as uh, just having that fun time. I think uh, learning should be fun. And I think for hypothesis, it made things um, fun again for a lot of the students who are coming back and a little apprehensive about asking those simple questions. And so thank you. I'm looking at the time. <laughs> no, thank you. And it's, I mean, for everyone on the call, definitely check out her session from back at our webinar and I think it was April yeah. uh, and the student feedback then was incredible and just even the nominations they came from faculty and students alike and that group was a big part of the win today so you can see it didn't just translate into them presenting but took them a long way and thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on them thank you all right and so uh just we're going to bring up our next winner uh and this is in uh, the social sciences. So we have Lyra Stein from Rutgers University. Hi, everyone. First, I want to thank you so much for this award. I really am honored. Um, I would like to share some of my experiences. Um, I teach two types of classes during the summer. I teach asynchronous um, online, but I want to focus on my in-person classes. So we were remote for a full three semesters. And when I came back in the spring of 22, I just know students were listless. They were not attending. They seemed bored. So during the summer of 22, I said, I need to do something. And my courses are large. For example, this semester, I have 700 students using um, a hypothesis across three different courses. So I decided to transform even my large courses into team-based learning. 
And using hypothesis was really integral for this. So the students have a reading um, in my soul beliefs class, in my psychopathology course, they have a case study. And we have class discussions. But to prepare for these, they have to carefully read through the, um, it's either a primary source article or the case study. And they use hypothesis to do that. So under the page notes, I will put six different prompts. I put them into groups of six. Currently, I have a 320 student course and they're in groups of six. And they are autonomous groups within hypothesis. So one person is delegated to be the one who assigns the annotations to make sure that each student does their annotation and does it well because they will need that information for their group project. And they're instructed, they're responsible for a certain part. For instance, the case study, one person will be responsible for the background, another one for the therapy and so on. And they have to interact with each other within their six person group on hypothesis, um, integrating their piece with their peers. And then when they come into class for the assignment, for their group assignment, they're dependent on each other's annotations to complete the assignment. So the, the assignment will be the, um, a full case study of the individual. And they will have to present their annotations and why they thought the way they did. And I've had a lot of success with this. Students enjoy it. Um, they are very adamant with each other that they have to get their annotations in on time or they, the rest of the group can't tie everything together. So um, they, they are very disciplined with this. And when they come into class with their annotations, they're able to analyze the client. And I've gotten feedback that they really enjoy this because before I used hypothesis, they would not read the case study at all. But when I make each of them is responsible for a different part, I am blown away at the detail they use in their annotations and how much they understand and they can link outside resources. And, um, at first, they're usually not as detailed, but then they realize that their group project is dependent on the correctness and the depth of their annotations and that other people in the group can use the annotations also. Um, so I, I am having a lot of success with this. I also use it in my asynchronous online courses. I used to have discussion boards. However, I replaced them with hypothesis in one of my courses, Psychosocial Foundations of Health and Medicine. They read primary source articles and previously they wouldn't read it. But now I put them into groups of six and each one's responsible for a different part. And then they can use that for their assignments. And I always have them try to tie their annotation in with someone else's. So you get that critical thinking there and making associations. And I just wanna mention that over the summer, I took hypothesis um, teaching with AI. And I'm very excited about implementing um, hypothesis with AI in my courses. I, I think it will make a big difference in uh, learning and uh, retention in the future. That's amazing. And so in essentially you know, two years, you've transformed your classroom. Students weren't doing the readings that they needed to. And you've built these small autonomous groups where students are able to work through case studies and primary source data. I mean, that's what they're gonna be doing when they get into the real world. So you're just preparing them. That's fantastic. What are you hoping to do with AI? 
Um, so I've started integrating AI into my courses. I think students need to learn how to use it. Um, so I have them do their own annotations first, and then they compare it to the AI output. What did AI get right? What did AI miss? Because, you know, sometimes AI gets things wrong and it makes up uh, references. And so I, I have them using a free chat GPT to compare their work and to analyze the output in relation to what they've come up with themselves. That's that's fantastic. And we'll have to have you come back for a liquid margins when you get that up and running so that we can hear how that goes as well. Sure, I would love to. Well, thank you so much and congratulations again, Lyra. Um, thank you so much. Well-deserved. All right, and so uh, then we've got our next winner coming up on deck. Uh, congratulations to Melanie Lenahan from Raritan Valley Community College uh, with our STEM category. Hi, Melanie, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Well, congratulations, and I think you've got some stuff to share. Is that right? I, I do. I'll, I'll try to share that now. And perhaps you can let me know if you can see my screen. We are good to go. Okay, great. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm really honored um, to receive this award. And I just wanted to uh, give some thanks uh, to those who, who really helped me along the way. Um, I first started using Hypothesis in a faculty learning community uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it was an opportunity for faculty to read papers and to annotate them and come together for discussion. And I was really excited about being able to use that in my own classes. Um, and it was Becky George and Christy DeCarolis um, from Hypothesis who gave me a pilot uh, to test it out once I got back um, after the pandemic on campus. And um, it, was, it was an excellent tool. Uh, since that time, we now have full integration in Canvas. And I've been working really closely with our um, instructional designer, Amy Cook, who's also been really helpful um, in, in helping me to um, integrate Canvas into my courses. And of course, I really want to thank my students who are uh, really gung-ho on uh, using um, Hypothesis once they get the hang of it. Uh, I found it to be an extremely powerful tool. Um, so I teach biology, genetics, and cellular and molecular biology. I've been a professor at this institution. This is my 22nd year. Um, so I just wanted to share a few ways um, that I use Hypothesis in my courses. Um, one of the reasons that I really love Hypothesis is that it aligns with my teaching philosophy um, that I feel that all students can learn and it's an inclusive teaching practice. I find that many students in in-class discussions may not want to contribute, um, but by giving them the opportunity to annotate a text or a video, uh, it really allows for all students uh, to participate. And that's, that's really important to me. Um, so one of the uh, strategies that I use in my classes, and this would be like in all of my classes across the board, is the annotate the syllabus uh, assignment, which I love. And again, it was Becky George who first introduced this to me. The idea is that students on day one, I give them an annotation assignment to annotate the syllabus by using compass points. And so the um, compass points, north, south, east, west, um, have meaning. So for E is for excited, W is for worried, N is for need to know, and S is for stance or to take an opinion. And what I ask my students to do is to annotate the syllabus, but tag it using these uh, different letters um, to designate um, excited, worried, need to know, or stance. And this is just an example of uh, a student's annotation where you can see that they've um, annotated the text and they've used uh, those tags. And um, what I do is on day one, I assign this. And then the following day that the class meets, 
I use this as a jumping point, a starting point uh, to take their concerns and their worries, and it becomes a very active discussion. At the very end of the semester, I also return to this assignment, and I have the students annotate the syllabus again, but this time I have them um, say what, what to keep, what to change. So what, what worked over the course of the semester, what might not have worked as well, and I ask um, for their feedback. So I found this to be a really powerful tool. Um, one, it gets them to read the syllabus, and two, we're not taking class time. This is something that they can do um, on their own. So I use this in, in all of my classes. Um, game changer, right, when uh, Hypothesis uh, allowed now using video annotations. Um, I was so excited about this opportunity to, to use video annotations. So in biology, um, there's a lot of visuals that we need um, to have students take a look at. Um, and so one uh, uh, set of YouTube videos that I use a lot are from the Protein Data Bank and um, trying to understand, for example, structure and nature of proteins or enzymes, it really lends itself to a video. So in the past, what I had done was to show the video in class and then ask the class you know, questions, but I would get very few responding. Um, so what I can do now is I can assign uh, the video annotation ahead of class time and then when students um, come to class, then I can use those annotations uh, to, again, start a discussion, start an in-class uh, discussion, and go through the video again. I found this to be very, very insightful um, because in the past, when I didn't have the opportunity uh, to have them annotate the video, I really didn't know their prior knowledge. Um, but by having them annotate the video, it really allowed me uh, to have some insight into their prior knowledge, what they knew and what they didn't know. So um, I really fell in love uh, with video annotations, especially um, in my biology classes. Um, another way that I use hypothesis, this is in one of my um, a kind of upper level classes a, in my cellular and molecular biology class, um, students have the opportunity to become authors. And there's an organization called Cy Worthy that has a professor partnership uh, program where students can choose a scientific, uh, primary scientific article. And then they work with the editors at SciWorthy to create a science communication piece. And they have the opportunity uh, to have that work published. And so what I found in my um, cell and molecular course is that the very first round of editing goes through me. So basically students will begin their um, scientific article um, uh, by going through the primary literature article and summarizing the science behind it. And so what I found was by having hypothesis, um, I could have those uh, primary literature articles in a way that students um, and myself, right, could edit them. We could go through the article together. And so we could better understand the science and then that enabled the students uh, to help them to write their science communication piece and then work directly with the science sci-worthy editors on the science communication part. So on the next slide is just an example of where I had a student with their primary literature article. Um, and you can see that that student had made um, several uh, annotations here in this frame. Um, again, going through that primary literature article, oftentimes students um, may get hung up on the jargon or not fully understand a, a particular type of experiment. So this really helped us to uh, be able to annotate that article together so that they could better understand the science to write their science communication uh, piece. 
So these are just some examples of how I use hypothesis in my courses. And um, I think it's an excellent tool. And I just have one example of a, of a shared uh, response um, to a reflection question from students. I'll often ask them what aspect of the courses have been most successful for them. This is just one example of a student who really enjoyed the annotation assignments felt that it helped them to understand biology and help them translate that onto the real world. So this is just one example, but I would say that a majority of my students um, really enjoy uh, using hypothesis in these different ways within my courses. So thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you about these and um, I'm thankful for the award. And congratulations on the award. I think STEM in particular, I, I spent a long time at a science tech company. And one of the challenges you have is not every student comes in with the same level of understanding from high school into a freshman biology course, for example. And it can really scare them off because they don't know that they're not the only person in the class who doesn't. I really like the way that you structure this and allow students to give that feedback, but especially the videos, that could be a game changer because you don't even know if they're watching them, never mind if they're commenting. So congratulations on all your success and the award, and thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Of course. Uh, so next we've got uh, Caroline Schroeder from University of Oklahoma, who's uh, taking our pedagogy award. Hi, Caroline. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this award. Um, I've been using Hypothesis for a while, um, but before I say anything more, I want to give a shout out to um, people from whom I've learned. Um, so Stephanie Cobb at the University of Richmond and Rebecca Craywick at Canisius University both um, gave me a lot of resources and sample assignments and things um, that have helped me improve my use of Hypothesis over the years. And then also um, to a uh, mentor and colleague in the Center for Faculty Excellence here at the University of Oklahoma, Geneva Murray. Um, so thank you. Uh, I use Hypothesis um, in my digital humanities classes. I have a joint appointment in women's and gender studies and a data scholarship program. And I teach an introduction to digital humanities as well as an upper division course. Um, and I use um, hypothesis in both of those classes um, as ways for students to engage with each other and the, um, the assignments, and also to try to integrate the assignments. So one of the things that I do is students are um, usually assigned an article about a particular method or approach in digital humanities, and then um, one or more website projects using that approach. And so students, um, I assign students to annotate the article um, because it can be a little complicated if you try to annotate a website that has many pages. So I have them annotate the article and um, one of the requirements of the assignment, the annotation assignment is to discuss um, details of the um, digital projects that are also assigned for that week. Um, and how they are using the methods or how they kind of interact with some of the things that are going on in the article that they're assigned. Um, and I also usually assign a discussion leader for the groups, the hypothesis groups each week. Um, and if I have enough students, I try to assign more than one um, so that um, that discussion leader, their job is to go in a couple of days before the assignment is actually due. And um, for their annotations, they're supposed to um, pose questions for the other students to consider um, as they're reading through the article, um, questions that arose for them that they um, you know, would like their other students to consider. And then the other students, um, can do other types of annotations as well, of course, but one of the things that they're asked to do is to respond to the questions. And I found that helps with the kind of um, last minute, um, you know, a lot of times you might find your annotations um, all appear like the last few hours before the, you know, class happens or the assignment is due. And um, this way there are a few things in there that students have already written 
um, when the other students come in. So it's um, th there's a little bit more, um, I think, kind of organic interaction in that way, because then the discussion leaders are also asked to go back in and respond um, to the responses so that there's a little more um, engagement, especially in the upper division course that is asynchronous online. Um, we use hypothesis instead of discussion boards because students really don't like discussion boards. And with hypothesis, it's just definitely feels more connected to the course material. Students aren't just kind of randomly saying things. Um, and it's it, students find it more productive. And I get positive comments from students um, in both my classes that I use this, but um, especially in the asynchronous class, they seem to like it a lot more than uh, discussion boards. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is just I use for both of those classes, I use a type of grading that's called um, specifications grading. And there's a book about it by Linda Nilsson, if you're interested. Um, and one of the things that happens with specifications grading is we don't give things um, like a, a, you know, assignments and like ABCD grade or a percentage grade. They um, students are given the requirements of the assignments. And if they meet the requirements, then they get credit for that assignment. And there are opportunities to revise or resubmit the assignment. Um, and so I'm really careful at the beginning of the semester in those first annotation assignments. I do actually sometimes tell students, you know, if the annotations are not um, really engaging with the material, right, they're just kind of going through the motions. I will, you know, provide feedback to the students and say, okay, this assignment is not getting credit and this is why. And then they dig in more um the next time so that um you know we help establish a pattern and they have the opportunity to revise so that if they want to go back and get credit for that assignment they can um but i found that it's hard to grade annotations on like a points or you know percentage basis other than just you did it or you didn't do it um so i use that method um in other assignments as well but i find it's it's useful um with the annotations that yes, you know, you can give individualized feedback about the annotations um, and it not be about whatever percentage of the grade. And I think, especially to your point, students don't like discussion boards. I hear a lot, discussion boards have turned more into agreement boards because they just have to go through those motions. So if they're on the text and they're getting the right type of feedback, they're coming out with stronger outcomes toward the end because they're doing that reading. Yeah, yeah. And the reading is right there, right? And yeah. so, um, yeah, they engage. And they, I found, especially, like I said, the asynchronous online, but also the in-person students do comment to me that they like um, engaging with each other in that way. And I wanted to give a big plus one to Melanie's point about allowing, allowing students to participate in multiple ways. Um, you know, quieter students might be on hypothesis um, more, uh, you know, they can, you know, express their um, analysis and their viewpoints um, and their insights more there than they might in class. So I, I completely agree with that. Well, amazing. And it's it's amazing work that you're doing. And we, we're super excited to have you here. Congratulations. And thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so then we have uh, our next winner is uh, Health Sciences. That's Rachel Durr at Rutgers University, Camden. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Thank you so much for the award. I am so honored. Um, I start. I was introduced to Hypothesis back in 2020, of course, when we all had to shift to online learning. And I've held on to it since then. And you know, still use it in uh, specifically in health sciences. I teach nursing. I'm at Rutgers University, the Camden campus in their school of nursing. And I find uh, social annotation to be very helpful in students. I do have a slide. Can I pull that up? Let's see. There we go. So I just wanted to talk a little bit 
today about how I use it in nursing. And, you know, some of this is nursing specific, but uh, in other areas, it can be, you know, transferred to other areas within the health sciences. So if you teach in nursing, you should be familiar with uh, Tanner's clinical judgment model, right? In nursing, we, we talk about how do we help a student start to think like a nurse? And this clinical judgment model, developing clinical judgment is kind of this starting point on how we get our students there, right? To learn how to think like a nurse. So in the model, it has four different steps, which are noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting. So what I did is I used this in one of the first nursing courses that the students take, and um, I'll assign them a reading through the hypothesis. But the way the assignment is explained is when you're doing the reading, the first thing I want you to do is notice what stands out to you. You know, what is most interesting to you? What, it, what is something new that you've never um, seen before or maybe something that you have a question about? And then the next step is to interpret that. So why did that stand out to you, right? Think about um, what makes that specific part of the reading important. So after interpreting, then they're going to respond, which is when they annotate. So they're going to annotate and express some of the reasons why it stood out to them, right? And then lastly, they're going to reflect. So this is where they you know, read through what their classmates have posted and reply to a, a classmate. And that's where you know, the conversation and that collaborative learning begins. So I use, again, hypothesis as a way to introduce students to the clinical judgment model and thinking like a nurse. Uh, another thing in nursing that I don't have it on this slide here is that you know, we are kind of transitioning. Well, nursing's always been a competency-based kind of discipline, right? But we are um, now really pushing that comp how important competency-based education is. And I use hypothesis and social annotation to meet some of those competencies, right? So I'm going to kind of link that competency-based learning to the next bullet topic, which is creating a safe space for difficult conversations. So being in the healthcare arena, you know, there are many topics as healthcare providers that, you know, may be sensitive to some to talk about. And when you try and talk about them, you know, in person in a class, there are many students who are resistant to offer their thoughts, right? They kind of close down. Um, but when you do that through hypothesis, then it's easier to get them to open up. So an example of like maybe some difficult topics could be um, ethical dilemmas, end of life care, substance abuse, mental health issues, uh, health disparities and social determinants of health, diversity, equity and inclusion. So they're just some examples, but those topics are all part of the competencies that we, you know, that our students should be graduating with. So by assigning um, an article based on one of those topics and having them use the clinical judgment model to work through it, they are able to meet a competency and demonstrate that they've met that competency. Uh, and then the final bullet point I wanted to talk about was introducing students to different types of literature. So, you know, in the health sciences, evidence-based practice is very important, but in order to use evidence in our practice, we have to be able to read and interpret the evidence, right? So I like to introduce students to all different types of literature or evidence that they may be exposed to, you know, different type of research, quantitative, qualitative, randomized controlled trials, um, just different types of research in general, and you know, clinical practice guidelines, meta-analysis and systematic reviews, opinion articles, just so you know, they can see what the differences are. And when they're approaching their annotation, approach it with the focus of 
the type of literature that it is, right? So then they start to understand better uh, what a clinical practice guideline is used for, how they can use it in practice, how they can use, you know, those research articles, um, and why meta-analyses and systematic reviews, you know, are so important and are considered, you know, for the most part, ranked very highly when we think about um, what we want, kind of literature we want to use in evidence-based practice. So I guess that kind of sums up what I'm doing in the classroom with hypothesis. And I, you know, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have. And again, to thank you so much for this award. I'm very honored. No, we're we're super excited to present this award to you. And you know, nursing is actually a place we get a lot of questions from folks. How would I use this? And I've just learned a lot here that I think our team's going to be able to share to help facilitate this across other schools. So you're you're spreading the good word and congratulations again. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so much. Of course. And then um, you know, we are wrapping up with our final award, uh, and that's our student impact award from Amanda Morales at the University of California at Merced. Hi, Amanda. Hello. I will hi, I will share my screens. I can't say too long, but I'm happy to share. Um, hello, everyone. I am honored to receive this award in the student impact category. And today I'm excited to just share very briefly how I've redesigned two of the courses I teach almost every semester using hypothesis um, annotation. So I've restructured my social inequality and sociology of the family courses to integrate social aspects of annotation. Um, so in these classes, I have students annotate our peer-reviewed research articles, and that helps them kind of decode those articles. Um, and then we also go through using the key concepts from those articles to apply it to film, TV scenes, film, and even music videos. And I've found that this approach really transformed the learning environment in my classroom. Um, so at the heart of this redesign is that two-step process where we're first going through and looking at our research articles. This gives students an opportunity to kind of break down really difficult and challenging material. Um, I actually assign articles that would be assigned in graduate level work. And so the students are at first feeling a little challenged by all of the, all of the interpreting and analyzing they need to do with those articles. But by the end of the first second or first or second annotation, students feel the sense of collaboration and shared understanding. And I also go in and leave notes on those. And once we've gone through that part of the research, we move on to the scenes, which students absolutely love um, because I actually try to pull scenes from TV shows and movies that they have already requested. Um, so we do that and we're really illustrating how these concepts play out in everyday our everyday life how we see them emerge in public and social life. Um, and then later on in the semester, I actually have students form, they're in groups, they're formed in groups, and I ask them to be in charge of finding the key concepts as they apply in TV and film scenes and music videos themselves. So I have groups finding their own videos, annotating, and then they're presenting those to the class. So what the class ends up seeing is a wide variety of these key concepts applied in the social world. Um, so students have found it incredibly engaging. Also at UC Merced, we have a really high percentage of students that are first in their family to attend college. And that can lead to sometimes students feeling a little um, apprehensive about sharing in class. And what I have found since using hypothesis annotation is that people like to use their what they already annotated as the basis of their comments in class. So I have students overwhelmingly sharing who previously were a little more on the quiet side. I have students helping each other think through how key concepts apply in these film scenes and TV scenes. And students are overall incredibly more, more engaged than they previously were. Um, so we, just to give a quick example um, of what this looks like, if you haven't yet annotated with the YouTube option, um, students picked this clip um, from the Big Bang Theory in our so Sociology of Family course, and it's about cohabitation. And as you can see in the comment here, um, a student was talking about 
the, the concept um, of cohabitation and relaying it back to one of the authors we read, um, Andrew Cherlin, and talking about how this scene really illustrates the things that couples negotiate before deciding whether or not to cohabit. So I think it is just an amazing program that gives our students the opportunity to not just decode peer-reviewed article, which is a challenge in and of itself, but also apply it to something that they are interested in. And it also helps them take what we're learning in the classroom and, and apply it and share it outside of the classroom. So I have students coming up to me telling me, yeah, you know, we were talking about the Big Bang Theory and I was telling my friends about it and now they want to take this class because they see how we're applying these concepts outside of class. So thank you so much. Um, I am really honored to receive this award and I will be using Hypothesis um, for the rest of my career. I, I love it. Thank you. Fantastic. And congratulations and nice job recruiting new students with uh, Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I guess just like every award show we ran over. So if you've stuck around, thank you so much. Uh, just with a couple of quick things. Um, we do have a few workshops that we wanted to let folks know. So if you are a hypothesis partner today, part of your subscription does include our partner workshops. So uh, this month we've got social annotation strategies on the 17th and 24th, focusing on research-based strategies and social annotation for textbooks. And then we will be running social annotation for student success and retention in November. So focusing on a few key topics, equity and belonging, designing with UDL in mind, and grading and feedback for social social annotation. Uh, we also do have our Hypothesis Academy that's been mentioned a few times. Uh, this is included with your Hypothesis subscription as well. It gives you a certified educator credential. It's a two-week asynchronous course that's designed to teach you how to design social annotation assignments. Uh, you can learn more and register at the next cohort that starts next week. And then on Halloween on the 31st, we've got a spectacular edition of Liquid Margins. Uh, don't let disengaged students haunt your class. That will be with one of our winners today, Dr. Love from University of Incarnate Word. You definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, so again, want to thank all of our winners and congratulate them all today and also to our nominees and to anyone that joined. This has been a really great session and um, can't wait to do it again next year. We'll be opening up nominations sometime this spring. So congratulations again. Have an amazing rest of your week. Tomorrow's Friday and I know I'm excited about it. So thanks everyone. And congratulations.